Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Edward Miller. I'm a professor in the history department here at Dartmouth, and I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's panel discussion, which is entitled Dartmouth 64s and the Vietnam War. As I think most of you know, uh, this event is being offered in conjunction with a course that I'm teaching here this term at Dartmouth on the Vietnam War, History 26, and also in conjunction with a senior seminar on American veterans and American military service that's being taught by my colleague, President Emeritus Jim Wright. Uh, the main goal of the, the event tonight is to learn a little bit about the Vietnam War. And we're going to do this by learning about the experiences of our panelists, all of whom are veterans who served in Vietnam. And as the title of this event suggests, they also all happen to be members of the Dartmouth class of 64. Um, many members, it's funny how that all fits together. Mm -hmm. Although many members of the class of 64 ended up serving in Vietnam, it's important to keep in mind that almost none of them expected to do so at the time they graduated from Dartmouth uh, just about 50 years ago. It will be 50 years ago in June. Uh, at that time, uh, the Vietnam War still seemed very far away. Uh, as the students in History 26 know, by 1964, the U.S. had been involved in Vietnam uh, and Vietnamese affairs in various ways for more than a decade. But American leaders had not yet taken the big fateful steps, the, the steps that in retrospect would be the things that, that really dragged the United States into the war in a, in a deeper way than the United States had involved previously and really turned the Vietnam War into an American war. Uh, in 1964, Vietnam was already known to Americans as a, a Cold War hotspot. That is a place where the U.S. was actively engaged in containing the expansion of communism. The U.S. had already spent billions of dollars in, in economic and military aid and sent tens of thousands of military advisors to Vietnam. But the United States had not yet set the massive numbers of American combat units. Um, and so in the eyes of most Americans, when these men graduated from, from Dartmouth in the spring of 1964, most Americans felt that the country was at peace and did not appear to be on the verge of plunging into a major war. Uh, but of course, we know now that, that the U.S. was, in fact, on the verge of doing just that. In August of 1964, less than two months after Dartmouth's commencement ceremony, U.S. warships were involved in the Tonkin Gulf incident off the coast of North Vietnam. U.S. President Lyndon Johnson seized on that incident as what he described as the unprovoked aggression of North Vietnam, and he persuaded Congress to give him very sweeping authority to retaliate against Hanoi. A few months later, uh, again, as History 26 students know only too well, he began a major strategic bombing campaign against North Vietnam known as Operation Rolling Thunder. He also sent the first U.S. ground combat forces to South Vietnam in the spring of 65. By the end of 1965, there were 185,000 U.S. troops in Vietnam with more on the way. So in the 18 months after these men graduated from this institution, the, the war in Vietnam was transformed in, in very profound ways. And again, our objective tonight is to learn about and discuss some of the consequences that these decisions had for Americans and uh, in particular for, for these four men. Uh, the way this panel is going to work as follows. I'm going to introduce each of the panelists to you. Each of them will make uh, some very brief remarks, and then we're going to open it up uh, for, uh, for questions and, and discussions with the members of the panel. Uh, but before I do that, I need to give you just a little bit of, of background and context. Um, the main thing that you need to know is that the mastermind behind this event tonight is not me. Uh, the, the, the person behind it all is, is Mr. Phil Schaefer. Phil, if you could raise your hand in the back there. Um, Phil is the secretary of the class of 1964. And for the past couple of years, uh, Phil has been strongly encouraging those of his fellow 64s who served in the US military during Vietnam to contribute to a book of essays that, that he's editing. Uh, this book, I'm, I'm very pleased to announce, is now complete. And it's about to be published by the University Press of New England. The publication date is April 1st. Uh, the 55 essays that it contains collectively offer a really fascinating glimpse into the history of the 1960s, not only into the history of the Vietnam War, but to, into the history of Dartmouth and into the various ways in which the Vietnam War became such a central feature in, in American life and American society, both on this campus and, and elsewhere. So this, this book is, is really a very impressive achievement 
No less impressive, Phil has persuaded his classmates to provide advanced copies of this excellent volume to all of the students who are enrolled in History 26, as well as to those who are enrolled in President Wright's seminar. So thanks to the generosity of the class of 64, all of the students here tonight will be going home with, a, with an advanced copy uh, of, of this book. So on your, on your way out uh, this evening, we will be having a reception immediately after the panel on your way out. If you are an enrolled student, um, please make sure you, you get your copy of that. Please join me in, in, in thanking Mr. Schaefer and, and the entire class of 64 for their, their generosity. Okay, without further ado, I'm, I'm going to introduce uh, the first of, of uh, the panelists going uh, from my right uh, to left. Um, first, we have Mr. Lee Chilcote, who is a native of Cleveland, Ohio. He, he still resides in Cleveland today. While at Dartmouth, Lee enrolled in Dartmouth's Navy ROTC program, and after graduation, he was commissioned as an officer in the Marine Corps. He arrived in Vietnam in February 1966 and served until, it was early 67, right? Right, March of 67. March of 67. Among his achievements in Vietnam, he was awarded a Bronze Star for combat service. Um, next to Lee is Mr. Glenn Kendall. He, uh, uh, Glenn is a native of Grand Junction, Colorado. Uh, while at Dartmouth, he participated in Army ROTC and commissioned after graduation as a second lieutenant. He served first with an airborne unit in Europe, but then was transferred to Vietnam in June of 1967 and served there until May of 1968. Uh, Jim Laughlin is a native of New Jersey. Uh, he also participated in Army ROTC. After graduating from Dartmouth, he chose to defer his military service to go to law school at the University of Michigan. After receiving his law degree, he took his commission as an Army lawyer and ended up going to, to Vietnam in that capacity. Uh, and while in Vietnam, Jim served both in Saigon and in the Mekong Delta, as I believe he's going to tell us about. Uh, last but not least, at the end of the table, we have Mr. Bud McGrath. Uh, Bud is a native of Wakefield, Massachusetts. He now lives in Maine, where he is a university professor. Uh, Bud also was a member of our Army ROTC while he was here at Dartmouth. Uh, like Glenn, Bud served first with an art artillery unit in Europe before being sent to Vietnam. He arrived in Vietnam in September 1967 and served there until August of 1968. Um, so please join me in welcoming these four panelists to Dartmouth. <laughs> Let me just turn things over to Lee. Okay, thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I want to first start with a, 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 an idea of what I'm going to do here. Um, I do have a few thoughts for you. They center around the idea of, of what uh, we as 1964s knew then and what you uh, know now through your coursework in a kind of a compare and contrast way. Um, I first want to begin by uh, taking just a note to about History 26 and Professor Miller, and this is also, I, did, I didn't have the pleasure of working with uh, President Wright's class, but I want to say this about History 26. I hope you all know who are taking that course just how fortunate you really are. Um, uh, I took, and this is the beginning of the compare and contrast side, I took military history courses, six of them, because it was required to do so by NROTC. Um, we superficially studied World War II, Pacific, and Europe, uh, superficially Korean War, and the Cold War up to the Bay of Pigs invasion, which is the last historical event that occurred by the time I was in college. By contrast, uh, you, uh, have read some very and listened to some very thoughtful online lectures. Um, you have read some carefully selected materials and selected books, uh, and you've had in-class discussion, discussion, which I've not been privileged to participate in. The course is outstanding. I, I just wish I had had it um, at that time. And the second point I'd make is, is what was happening pre-Vietnam and what I did. Uh, being a smart Dartmouth graduate, I decided I was going to do some reading, history reading. So I read about the French colonization between 1930 and 1954. 
I read about a book about the fall of Dien Bien Phu. Uh, I read about the Geneva Conference. Um, by contrast, what you're being asked to do and what you, many of you have already done um, is to really critically think about the history of that time. And the thing that um, brings this home to me the most is I looked at the essays that you all were asked to consider and write one of. Uh, and the one that struck me the most was the compare and contrast of Ho Chi Minh's DRV state and Diem's RVN state. I keep thinking if the leaders of our country had known what you know now through your readings, then uh, what difference there might have been as far as Vietnam. So I'll leave you with that. This th third area I want to talk about, and specifically to give you some context, is training and skill sets. Um, and this is, again, a compare and contrast. We were trained for World War II, Korean War, conventional warfare. Um, one of the funniest stories that I have that occurred to me was that after all my training in officer's training school, and I'm now in Camp Pendleton, California, and I'm about four days away from shipping out to Okinawa and ultimately into Vietnam, the major, who is commander of our battalion, comes up to me and says, Lieutenant, I want you to teach a guerrilla warfare course. And, I, and this is just after the troops have been on a, their first live fire exercise of their lives. They've come through Paris Island, and they're out there with live ammunition crawling across the ground and trying not to shoot each other. And um, he comes up to me and says, you had to teach this guerrilla warfare course. And I said, um, Major, can you explain how I'm going to do that? I don't have any materials. We didn't have it in officer's training school. And what would you like me to do? And he looks at me as if I'm being a little impertinent. And he says, come with me. And he takes me in his office. He hands me a manual by Ch Che Guevara. Uh, now, Che Guevara was one of the most ruthless guerrilla fighters that this world has ever known. If you read about Che Guevara and what he did in South America, well, the major told me to teach it, so I taught it. That's what I did. Um, but but the, the lesson I'm trying to get across here is that um, at our dinner uh, two nights ago and our lunch uh, today uh, with veterans, um, I saw people who could command and have commanded, NCOs or officers, um, are better schooled, better skill sets than I could imagine. Um, when I was there, um, we would do things like try to ferret out the Viet Cong. That was our job. That's what we did. Well, how did we do this? We would go into the villages and we would ask, you know, where are the Viet Cong? How many people you suppose answered that? When I heard what these young commanders ha are doing and have done uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, I realized that we have a very powerful leadership group. And it's important to understand uh, the, the, the skill sets there. Uh, the fourth area I want to talk about is, is sort of the fog of war, which you've, I'm sure, read in several of our essays. Um, I'd say here, the more things change, the more they stay the same in relationship to this. Uh, from what I know of Marines today, um, they've always moved forward. They've never hesitated, and that's what they've done time immemorial. And I can tell from the Army and Marines that I've met here that nothing has really changed there. The difference that I see uh, is that when I was in Vietnam, all the services were entirely separate. I would get permission from the Navy to call in naval gunfire. I would get permission uh, from the Army to use artillery. I would get commission, permission from Marine Air to call in Marine Air. Uh, to do what we were supposed to do. At that time, similarly, we faced things, we faced snipers, we faced uh, Viet Cong with rifles and, and, and mortars, but none of the sophistication, although later in 1967, we faced regular NVA troops, as I indicated, and they had Russian and Chinese weapons. But 
The point I'm trying to make is if you look at today and you look at the sophistication on both sides of the equation, it is incredible. Uh, the important thing is that the Navy, the Army, and the Marine Corps work together collaboratively across interdisciplinary lines. Um, it, it's amazing to me. And so that's sort of my fourth point. A harder topic, casualties and KIAs. Um, we had great medics who helped us whenever a, a soldier or a Marine got hurt. But the fact is, we lost 58,000 people in Vietnam. If you look at the way things occur today, my guess, and it's just that, is that we would have only a fraction of those people lost. One of the reasons is that the speed of, of, of support for these troops and the quality of medical technology is just beyond belief. It's amazing to me. Now, understand as you will, that what that means is there's going to be a lot of injured people uh, coming back to this country, amputees and so forth. And importantly, in that realm is the mental side of it. When I was in Vietnam, we didn't even know what the word PTSD, there was no such word. We called it battle fatigue. And we didn't know really what was happening. I lost a number of troops who just couldn't handle the situation. And I had never seen it before, and nobody had ever told us about it. What I like about today is that there is a strong effort, and a lot of it is not so much in the military, but in the civilian side of things, to support these troops coming back, to help them with their wounds and to help them with their mental issues. And they're real, and they're going to hit your generation like a, a Mack truck. So. Uh, I'm glad that they're, they're being addressed. The sixth area I want to talk about briefly is leadership. In 1965, we were 100% patriotic. Um, we were the children of Depression and World War II parents. So naturally, we were ready to go. We went to Vietnam willingly. I volunteered. I wanted to be infantry. We thought we would win the war, and we went there to do so. When we came home, of course, things changed. We had stars and stripes over there, so we never knew anything. I've told this story many times, but I came to Coronado, California uh, in March 17th of 1967. I walked into a bar to have my first beer in the States. I promptly get in, got into a fight. I probably haven't been in two fights in my life, but that was one of them. The second thing that happened is a Marine was shot in Chicago coming off a plane. I couldn't believe it. So that was the first time I really realized that um, the, the, there was an anti-war protest going on in the United States. However, from from the veterans that I have met in Cleveland, I participate in the Marine Corps birthday on November 10th. You're all invited if you wish to come every year. And uh, we get about 100 Marines that come in, and about 50 of them are Iraq and um, Afghan veterans. And I can't tell you how impressed I am with their leadership and their past leadership and what they describe. Similarly, at yesterday evening's dinner and today's lunch, I was incredibly impressed with the leadership that's evident in these young men and women. Um, the, um, when I was in the service, um, most of the officers had not been in combat because Korea ended in 1953 and we were in 1965. And so what I found was that the majors and captains, I was a second lieutenant, who were above me were just <coughs> as green as me and we were going into the same war. Well, if you look at today, these men have been through Iraq 1, Iraq 2, Afghan 1, Afghan 2. 
and they're the most experienced military leaders that we've ever had in the history of this country. That's terrific for this country. The last thing I'll say is personal. Today, knowing what I know, I don't think I'd be nearly as naive about going to war uh, as I was. But <coughs> I'm here, and I can say that the Marine Corps was probably the greatest experience of my life because it made me, it gave me the self-assurance to know that what I was going to do in life, I could do, and I've tried to live life to its fullest. So I, I thank you for listening to me and uh, welcome your questions. Thank you, Lee. Glenn Kendall. Thank you. Um, I'd like to echo Lee's praise for this history course. It's fantastic. Uh, again, I, I wish we would have had that before we, uh, we went. I wish we would have known a lot more. And I also wish that every university in the United States had a course like that. I guess I would even wish that every student that goes to a university would mandatorily take the course. Um, I'd like to give my own personal thanks to Phil Schaefer. I was really resistant to participate in this process. Phil called me, I don't know, 15 times and kept pushing and pushing and pushing because some of the things that come up are pretty emotional. And thank you, Phil, for, for that. Um, I'd like to thank my uh, 1964 classmates for supporting the project. And then I'd like to thank you for coming to listen to a bunch of old guys reminisce about an old war. But here we are. Uh, it, it, it may be interesting to explore why, we, why I got into this in the first place. Grand Junction was a really isolated community. I didn't see television until I was 16 years old. Um, we had good schools. I got a scholarship to Dartmouth, and I came. Uh, Dartmouth was good for me. Um, and I had, from a very early age, this idea that my mission in life was to make the world free for democracy. That's, and I'm not quite sure where that came from. I know a few of the influences. Uh, at that time, it was the McCarthy era. There was a communist behind every rock. It, it, it wreaked havoc in our society for some time. In my high school, we had classes that taught us about the communist threat and how serious it was. Um, and, and so th there were the bad guys. There were already the bad guys. And then uh, there was this guy, Audie Murphy, who was a World War II Congressional Medal of Honor winner wrote a book called To Hell and Back, which I read, and then I saw the movie starring Murphy. And as a, a pubescent teenager, that was pretty heavy stuff. It was very motivating. Um, I r delivered newspapers every evening, about 125 of them. But before I delivered the papers, I would read them. And I read about the communist threat and what was happening and why it was uh, such a serious problem. It was during and just after the Korean War. So. Um, at Dartmouth, I, I was in Army ROTC, and um, I know it's different now because we met with the ROTC guys at lunch today, but ROTC at Dartmouth didn't do much to prepare me for landing in a hot landing zone. That means you're being fired at as you go in in helicopters uh, and leading 150 guys in with you. That wasn't quite the preparation that we had to do that. Um, the summer camp at Fort Devens was better, and that's where I first, that was between junior and senior year, when I realized, uh, I learned some soldierly skills, and I realized I was capable of being an inf infantry officer. In 64, I knew very little about Vietnam. Uh, I was more concerned about my upcoming duty in Germany, but the second I got to Fort Benning, Georgia for my initial training, I realized that before I got out, I was going to go to Vietnam. I started paying attention. Uh, after, after Fort Benning, I served for two years in Germany. It was pretty good duty. We flew around Europe in C-130s and jumped out of them to show the guys on the other side of the Berlin Wall that we were strong and powerful and spent the rest, the, most of the rest of our time guarding nuclear weapons sites. Uh, it's pretty boring. Uh, I went to Vietnam in June of 67 and took command of Delta Company 2nd Battalion 1st Infantry, 196 Light Infantry Brigade. It was just outside of Chu Lai, south of Da Nang, in the northern part of Vietnam. Um, <clears throat> this, one of the issues that I haven't seen raised much, but uh, I think is important to appreciate as we go along. 
My company was made up mostly of Afro-Americans from Watts and Harlem, many of whom had the choice of either going to jail or joining the military. Uh, there was one, uh, one squad, that's about 10 guys, who were Puerto Ricans that spoke no English. And then there was Sergeant Fernandez, who was bilingual, so I had one Spanish-speaking squad with a translator to, to do it. There were very few white, uh, white officers, all of the, uh, white men. All of the officers were white, a captain and five lieutenants. And we had some really competent black NCOs. They were the real guts of the company. Uh, uh, three of them didn't make it through. Racism was a real issue in Vietnam, and it became worse. I think you heard uh, uh, McLean talk a little bit about it. It became worse the farther along we got. There were rumors of, of black men shooting their white officers. Uh, I know it happened on a couple of occasions. I was really quite fortunate because in my first combat experience, we landed in this hot landing zone, and in front of me there was a soldier who was wounded. And I crawled over the rice paddy dike and pulled him back, as you would do. And it turned out he was black. And after that, I had no problem at all with my guys. They, they supported me when I needed supporting. <clears throat> um, I, I think it's important to note that the guys, the men in Delta Company were as good American soldiers as you could ever produce. They were patriotic and courageous. From my perspective, I don't think we ever really understood the, de the dedication of the Vietnamese people. And they really wanted the foreigners out of their country. One day, just before Tet, uh, we were walking along towards the village, and we came under really heavy fire from machine guns, AK-47s, and mortars. And I do what you're supposed to do, and you send some guys this way and some guys this way, and you go in, and we finally entered the village. We had minor casualties who were medevaced, and we started looking for the men. We couldn't find them. We never did find them. And there was, in the village, there must have been maybe 30 women, many with babies. And there was one lady who was clearly the leader of the village. She was about 30 years old, and she was pregnant. And so, and on my uniform, I had my captain's bars, and my jump wings, and my combat infantryman's badge. And uh, so with my interpreter, I started uh, talking with her. And I said, where are the men? There are no men here. Who was firing on us? I heard no firing. Where did the men hide? There are no men here. Who made you pregnant? And grinning, she said, American Airborne Captain. <laughs> <laughs> she, was, she was really defiant. And, and we're never going to win her heart and mind, especially since afterwards we sent her and her colleagues to a really awful refugee village, burned her, vi burned her village down, shipped her rice back to the, to the refugee village and released all of her domestic animals. That's not probably the, not quite the right way to win the hearts and minds. Um, as I wrote in, the, in my piece, uh, I had not really any training to be a company commander in Vietnam. I had the necessary soldierly skills. I could read a map and I could art adjust artillery fire and I knew all of the weapons in the infantry company. Um, and I knew about tactics and I knew about first aid. But for example, the weapon of the infantry in Vietnam was an M16 rifle. I, I had never seen an M16 rifle, much less fired one. When I assumed command of this company, I had never touched the basic weapon that we were using. Um, I also, I'd used the old NATO um, uh, M14s, the big heavy ones, that was used in Germany. I knew absolutely nothing about Helleborn assaults. I knew nothing about the calling for and adjusting close air support from jet fighters or helicopter gunships. Um, in, in, in your reading about Vietnam, you hear about units that are shipped to Vietnam and not being well trained. In my piece, I write about the experience of going four days after I assumed command, going into a hot landing zone without these basic skills, which I should have had uh, in the process of doing it. And, and to me, that reflects some lack of leadership at some level way above mine to allow that kind of thing to happen. <clears throat> um, okay, where am I here? Uh, 
I also wrote in my piece a little bit about one night, well into my tenure as a company commander, back at, 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 after a night of really heavy casualties and uh, heavy fighting, we went back to a support base and uh, the guys were taking their showers and getting clean clothes and writing letters home. And I came to the conclusion, it just dawned on me very quickly, that was not the way to make the world free for democracy. It's what we were accomplishing with all of that effort, all of the money, all of the lives lost, was, was nothing. So I submitted my resignation from the Army. I still had to serve contractually for about another two years, uh, which I did, including another four months with my battalion in Vietnam. Um, I think that the perspective, the general perspective that I got at Dartmouth enabled me to reach that conclusion and then have enough whatever it was to act upon it. Um, Aldous Huxley said, you have to be careful and listen to this, <laughs> that men do not learn very much from the lessons of history is the most important of all lessons that history has to teach. I studied German when I was at Dartmouth, and in Germany I was frequently asked to be a liaison officer with the Bundeswehr, the German army. Um, and I befriended a German lieutenant who later became the equivalent of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Germany. And he attended the U.S. Army War College, which is a training program for generals. And one day in class he encountered something that was inconsistent with what had happened in Vietnam. And he asked his instructor uh, about this inconsistency. And this, the instructor, who was an Ar U.S. Army general, said, Vietnam was an aberration. <laughs> Um, I know that oppose the war and support the warriors is a rather controversial philosophy. But I think if you don't care for your warriors, your veterans, and their families, the society as a whole loses its, a piece of its collective soul. And we become inured to the terrible cost of waging war, making it more likely that we will engage in yet another unnecessary war. In Vietnam, we walk through jungles um, denuded by Agent Orange. For decades after the end of the war, the VA refused to admit that Agent Orange did anything to anybody. It took about 25 years before the VA started taking care of people who were harmed by Agent Orange. I was treated for prostate cancer caused by Agent Orange. Jim has even worse experience than that, and generally speaking, we're probably a bit luckier than some of the others who uh, suffered that problem. Um, we need to take care of our vets or we're going to do it again. I finally stopped having the nightmares where I wake up just before I'm killed in combat. Um, but working on this project has brought back some really uh, emotional memories for me. Uh, hopefully our efforts will contribute to a much better communal understanding about the overwhelmingly awesome responsibility of deciding to wage war and sending our warriors to risk their lives. I'm still trying to make the world free for democracy. I'm still supporting our vets. I still oppose unnecessary wars. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Jim Laughlin. I would like to make one minor correction to Professor Miller's opening remarks. I did not go to Vietnam as an Army lawyer. I wasn't about to sign up for five years of active duty <laughs> when I only had a two-year term to do. So I'm here to answer any questions you may have regarding my service and my experiences. I understand that all of you have read the essay I prepared, which is in this new book you're about to receive. I did think I would tell you a little bit about my background uh, because I'm kind of a Dartmouth success story. I was born and raised in the town of Kearney in Hudson County, New Jersey, exactly opposite the Meadowlands from New York and bounded on the south and the west by the beautiful Passaic River in the city of Newark. <laughs> All four of my grandparents were born in Europe. When my mother started grade school, she couldn't speak a word of English. To her dying day, she couldn't pronounce a TH sound in Dartmouth, but even though she couldn't pronounce it, she knew a good thing when she saw it. I, uh, was expected to succeed. It was just an unwritten understanding in my household that I would do well, and I was able to gain admission to Dartmouth. 
went through the ROTC program, went to Michigan Law School, and then went to active duty in the service after I'd been married for about 18 months. So having said that, I'm open to your questions and I'll turn the opening remarks over to my friend Bud McGrath, whom I've known since we were freshmen here. Thanks, Jim. Bud. Um, I would like to add my thanks to, uh, to Phil Schaefer, um, whose perseverance, his tact, his taste, um, has made all of this possible. And you haven't seen the volume he produced yet, but it's a very impressive volume. It has an incredibly useful index, which I did not expect. And having produced a couple of index indices myself, I know what kind of work that involves. Um, the contextualizing introductions by President Emeritus Wright uh, and Professor Miller uh, are also um, extremely helpful uh, and useful. And it's not just a collection of stories. It's the story of a generation. Um, and when I came back from Vietnam, I went directly to graduate school. And nobody ever asked me about my experience over there. And even over time, um, most members of my family have never inquired about it either. Um, more recently, strangers have thanked me for my service, yeah. um, mainly um, as a result of the influence of um, veterans of the Iraq and uh, Afghanistan wars. But this volume is an enormous expression of gratitude for the service of Dartmouth um, Vietnam vets. And um, I'm deeply grateful to Phil, and I'm sure I speak for everybody who has contributed essays to that volume. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about um, sort of my own reflections on um, my Vietnam experience. <clears throat> You're about at the point in your syllabus where I went to Vietnam, um, although you know a lot more. <coughs> about that situation uh, than I did when I went there, or that I even do, that I even do now. Um, but uh, I've got a few observations, I guess, I'd like to sort of pass on that I've kind of generalized from my own experience, um, and hopefully it will provoke some thinking about Vietnam and um, other unwinnable wars of opportunity. Um, Warfare is, I think, one of the most profound paradoxes of human nature. Our history and our literature, all the way from the Iliad and the Odyssey and Beowulf, tell us that war is a fundamental human activity. And yet war is also fundamentally dehumanizing. You either dehumanize your opponent by preserving them, for example, as krauts, slant eyes, gooks, towel heads, whatever derogatory terms um, GIs typically come up with. Or you de dehumanize yourself as a professional killing machine with drugs or with other distancing or dissociative mechanisms. Um, I know in the last um, incarnation of this course, uh, they used the film uh, Full Metal Jacket um, and the example of Gomer Pyle and there is what happens when you are not able to dehumanize either yourself or the enemy. It results in some form of psychic trauma. <clears throat> My own um, choice, I think, for a film that represents the Vietnam, this aspect of the Vietnam War, is The Deer Hunter. And I think in that film, the gambling sport of Russian roulette, I think, is one of the most moving metaphors for this kind of self-dehumanization that is encountered in war. And PTSD, self-loathing, suicide, psychosis, these are all things that are involved in that same sort of psychological mechanism. 
And another irony is that the dehumanizing process is also a kind of psychic mechanism that preserves our sanity and our human humanity in getting us through the situation. Another question I'd like to raise is about unwinnable wars and why we keep engaging in them. Guerrilla wars that have a base of popular support uh, is one type of unwinnable war. Our own American Revolution was such a war. Irish revolutions from 1798 to 1916 um, uh, provide other examples. Um, Vietnam, Afghanistan. Um, another type of unwinnable war is our civil war. Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, and now Syria. Um, and you ask the question, you know, what degree of foreign intervention would we have tolerated in our own civil war? So with Libya and Syria, maybe we're finally learning our lesson about intervening in these wars. And although neither Libya nor Syria is doing very well at the moment, I doubt that our military intervention would improve things very much in the long run. And also, I think, attempts to impose a centralized governing structure on a tribal culture, which includes much of the Middle East, has not made, met with much success. Uh, it took the British over 700 years to try to do this in Ireland, and they did not succeed any better than they succeeded themselves in Afghanistan, or that the Russians succeeded in Afghanistan. So um, one of the things that I did in preparation uh, for this talk um, last year is um, I used Google Earth and Google Maps to refresh my memory of places and distances in Vietnam where I had been and, uh, and so forth uh, for writing this, this essay. And many of the former military bases where uh, I had operated are now industrial complexes. And Vietnam now has one of the fastest growing economies in the world. And it's one of our trading partners. And so much for the validity of the domino theory that was used to justify the war in Vietnam. And how much sooner would Vietnam have reached where it has reached now if it were not for the French and for us? So I think one of the most profound weapons for influencing international politics is not military interve intervention, but our example of how to live and treating other countries with dignity and respect. We now trade with Vietnam. We also trade with China instead of fighting with them. So I think that despite uh, its currently disappointing results, the Ar Arab Spring accomplished more in the Middle East and North Africa than our military ever, ever could, and with far less cost in lives and the share of our national budget. So with that, I open it to any questions any of you might have. Thank you very much, Bud. Uh, the floor is open to questions. Uh, the way this will work um, is that you'll ask your question. I'm going to repeat the question just so the, the question is, is recorded uh, as part of the video that we're making of the proceedings here. Um, I would ask that um, since I don't think we all know each other here necessarily, if you could please identify yourself, give us your name. If you're a Dartmouth student or a Dartmouth alum, please give us your, your class year. And then if you're directing your question to a particular member or, or members of the panel, if you could please indicate that. So with that, the, the floor is open. <laughs> Gil. Uh, you guys all, or most of you came from the ROTC program? At Gil, Gil, what did I just say? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm Gil, uh, I'm a current student. Um, what was the last thing? Year. 14. Um, so you guys, I think you all came, or maybe three of you came from the ROTC program. Um, and that program got shut down like very soon after you left Dartmouth. So I wanted to hear your 
opinion or how that affected your relationship with the school or, or what you thought of the development um, in light of your service? Okay, so the, the, the question is all four of the panelists uh, were part of the ROTC programs at Dartmouth while they were here. The ROTC program, I, I believe it was shut down in 1973, if, if, if that's correct. So, so it wasn't right after, but it was about nine years after uh, these men graduated. And the question is, how did this affect, what did they think of this, and how did this affect their relationship with Dartmouth? Go ahead. I don't think it affected my relationship with Dartmouth, but I certainly felt that the elimination of the ROTC program on numerous campuses around the country took away a tremendous leavening effect that was provided by liberal arts graduates to the professional military. We were confronted with a situation after the elimination of many of these programs where the officer corps became top weighted with professional military graduates from West Point, the Naval Academy, the, the Virginia Military Institute, and so forth. So I think it had a very long-term deleterious effect on the uh, what I'll call the human aspect of the military services. I, it, ROTC was relatively popular when we were here. I, there were 150 in Army mm -hmm. ROTC, something like that. I think even more and than the, that. Yeah. And the Navy ROTC had a, a very large contingent. So maybe 25, 30% of the class was in ROTC. It wasn't considered to be a very negative thing at the time. Uh, we did. We were not jeered when we marched around the green on Wednesday afternoon in our uniforms, for example. Um, I also believe that it's it, it's essential that we have liberal arts educated military officers to leaven out the influence of the the West Pointers, the Naval Academy graduates. Uh, I had experiences. I don't know if you read anything about toxic leadership recently. It's a big topic, but. Uh, had some officers, uh, all they wanted to do was get their Bronze Star and their, their uh, Vietnam Service Medal so they could be promoted to the next level. And that was, became far more important than actually executing the war. And I think we exerted a, a leveling impact on that. And I think that's important that we continue that. One of the reasons I think that, the, uh, that ROTC was, um, was so popular was um, because of the draft. Um, you know, you know, in ROTC, going as an officer, you had some choice as to your military specialty and your theater of operations. Um, and um, I, I am a firm belie believer um, in the draft and uh, because it keeps circulating the civilian population through the military. And I think our political leaders uh, would be a lot more cautious about how they employ the military um, if, um, if there was a, a draft or some form of universal service. Um, so, um, but um, as with Jim, I mean, it, I, I understood that it was an unpopular war that eliminated a lot of these ROTC programs. <clears throat> but I, I don't think eliminating them um, was the right solution. I guess what I would add is that in the Marine Corps, when I was in service, there were many families who sons were the third or fourth generation uh, in the Corps. The same thing was true for the Navy. And what I found was that um, the R ROTC balanced that out. It frankly was very tough coming from Dartmouth College through ROTC to be in competition with Marines whose entire family history was tied up with the Marine Corps, whose fathers had served Korea, World War II, et cetera, and so on. The result of that is that it, it made me a, 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 a heavier competitor to try to succeed against those guys, but I could really see that if none of us had been part of those units, it would, have been, it would have made a difference. I think there's a certain narrowness that existed. Now, I suspect today that that's not as true because of the way the volunteers uh, come to at least the Marine Corps, and I'm sure the other services, that it's more balanced. But I, I can remember being concer concerned about that at the time. Yeah. Tough question. Question. We want tough questions. <laughs> 
In, in the back, please. Uh, hi, I'm Clinton Grable, uh, 14, uh, here at Dartmouth College. Um, I have a question for all the panelists. Uh, I was just hoping maybe you could describe uh, to the audience how not only Dartmouth reacted to the evolution of Vietnam, or maybe not just generally, but how you saw it, maybe from your perspective. And I know you're all from very like, uh, geographically diverse places in the United States, how your hometowns uh, reacted uh, to the evolution of the Vietnam War, you know, support against it, and how you, know, you personally interact with uh, that kind of support or opposition. Okay, so the question is, uh, how did the panelists see uh, different parts of American society responding to the Vietnam War as the war <coughs> unfolded? Both how did they see Dartmouth responding to it, and then how did they see their, their home communities responding to it? I'm not sure I understand. Yeah, I'm not sure I quite get the question, but if, if the question is how, how we reacted to society, or is it how I, society... I, I think sort of, the, I, I gather the question is about how people in the United States responded to the war as the war escalated and as American involvement in it deepened. Is yeah, that like correct? Did, you know, what type of opposition did you encounter? You know, did people call you baby killers? Did that, oh. many of you, did people support you? Did they thank you? What did, what did you see either well, Dartmouth or your own town? You know, be quite, quite frank about it, when we returned, it was pretty evident that um, the entire country was turning heavily against the war, so we shut down. We didn't talk about our experiences. We were we became indistinguishable from the protesters, and we we watched it. So nobody called us anything because they didn't know we'd been there. I I was uh, under medical care when I came back from Vietnam for almost a year, at Fort Devens, Mass. Immediately thereafter, I went to Tuck School. In the spring of 1970 the anti-war protesters occupied Parkhurst Hall and shut down Dartmouth College. Uh, final exams were canceled. Uh, there were demonstrations on the green. Uh, at Tuck at that time, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I think there were at least five Vietnam vets. It, we did exactly what Lee said, just shut down. Uh, I, it, President Kimeny at the time handled the situation really well. He, he let people blow off steam, uh, they were allowed to express their opinion, uh, and, and we survived very nicely compared to other places, say, for example, Kent State, where they killed people. But it, it, it impacted even here in Hanover, that the, the anti-war protest. Personally, I never felt any personal threats, but nobody knew I was a vet. Nobody wanted to hear about the war experience. Just shut down. You know, I'll second or third that. I was the same way. I wouldn't talk about my experiences. I think the country was pretty much turned against the war, and if the turning point, I believe, was the 1968 Tet Offensive, yeah. where for the first time, we sat back after a major military victory. The U.S. Armed Forces basically crushed the Viet Cong and the Viet Minh, but for the first time, we realized these guys weren't going to quit. And I think that was a psychological turning point in the war that led to the vast popular feelings against the war. And unfortunately, that got extended to the warriors in addition to the policymakers. Another thing is we were, I think, pretty much cocooned within the middle military when the protests uh, started. And uh, I mean, I, I, I reported for active duty a couple of days after graduation. And, um, you know, as um, I think, Lee, did you mention Stars and Stripes? Yeah. No, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> but st uh, Stars and Stripes was the Army newspaper uh, mm -hmm. that was distributed um, to military personnel all over the world. And it was highly censored. Uh, so, um, we didn't know much about what was going on back here. I mean, we, you would get you know, sort of brief, uh, brief mentions of, of it, but, you know, nothing, nothing in detail. And, um, and I kept a fairly low profile after um, um, uh, I got out of the military uh, while I was in graduate school un until, the, um, until um, Nixon started bombing Cambodia, and I got involved in any war um, activities myself. I'll share one other quick 
story here. I was in law school in uh, 1969 um, when the bombing in Cambodia occurred. And at that time, our law school class was almost 50% veterans and 50% uh, students who had come out of Berkeley who only went to law school so that they could defer because that we, we still had deferment there. And they were great students. But when that event happened in May of, I think it was May of 70? Yeah, May, May of 70. Um, about 100 of those students left school entirely. They, they not only were excused from exams, they excused themselves from the, the law school. And I was, I was flabbergasted because the rest of us just wanted to go to school and get our education, get it, become lawyers or whatever we were pursuing. So I, it was mind-boggling to me at the time. To, to, to emphasize again, um, went to San Francisco in 1971. <laughs> there were a couple hundred Vietnam vets living on a street. Uh, they had this training program to teach vets uh, vocational skills, elect, le electrician or plumber or something like that. These fly-by-night schools would take the tuition money from their GI Bill the guys were never trained. Uh, the the uh, treating PTSD was, as Lee said, was brand new, and these people were just not behaving right. We we didn't treat our vets the way they deserved to be treated, and that we suffered that, as I, as I mentioned in my talk. Uh, I'm Jesse. I'm a 15. Um, so given the United States is sort of propensity to. Uh, find themselves in these unwinnable wars. Um, under what circumstances would you would you all say um, it's ethically or, accept, or ethical or acceptable for the U.S. to enter into a war? There's a hard question. That's a good question. <laughs> that's, good. That's, good. that's good. Um, I think that one of the things that I mentioned or referred to in my talk was that. What you're learning in terms of critical analysis of history, it does not seem to me that there are very many administrations in our country um, that have learned it. If you go back to the Eisenhower administration and you think of the um, knowledgeable people who uh, were involved in the Cold War, who had been involved in World War II, um, people like Dean Rusk. I mean, President Eisenhower was probably the leading general in the history of this country at that time. He was President of the United States. Yet, you look at the start of Vietnam, and this is, of course, what you're studying, so I'm on dangerous ground, but I can tie it back to an ambassador who announced to President Diem that the United States supported the Diem regime I think it was 1955, if I have my year right. Um, and you know, look who's look who's Secretary of State, look who's Secretary of Defense, Dulles, and look who's President of the United States and the experience that they had. So it's incredible to me that in one of the uh, one generation of an administration that was theoretically that one of the most knowledgeable and well versed, they didn't look at their history. Because if you look at what Ho Chi Minh had been doing for 25 years, and you look at who DM was, you would, you would start out with the knowledge that you had an unwinnable war. We seem to be repeating that. So coming to your question, I think it might be the study of our past history and really understanding which um, effort is the right effort and understanding um, and trying to understand what its exit strategy is or should be. And, and it takes a lot of ethics and hard work to do that. Is, it would be a partial answer to you. I, I would point to, um, uh, to the first Iraq war as one that, you know, at least made more sense uh, than the others we got involved in. Um, Saddam Hussein, it was a war of aggression where um, Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait. It had a clear and limited objective that was achieved. Um, and then we pulled out. 
And that didn't even pass, that lesson didn't even pass down from father to son. <laughs> I, I think there's, um, that, that, it's an excellent question. There's, there's one, let me tell you what I think. I think I agree with uh, the first Iraq War. I also think we had to do something against Al Qaeda after 9 11, but we didn't need to stay in Afghanistan after that. Um, we Americans think that we're invincible. You know, all we have to do is tell our soldiers to go somewhere and do something and they'll do it because they're, they're amazing soldiers. And after all this time, we still haven't learned that that's not true. So, you, you, oh, we, we need a half a million guys to go calm down these little dark-skinned people in Vietnam. We'll, we'll take care of them. Uh, and we're, we're not invincible. Also, it, it's, um, if you look at the amount of effort that was involved in World War II and the preparation for it, and the, it's, it's difficult, tough stuff. You can't just sort of casually sit there, as Lyndon Johnson did, in some room with four other guys, none of whom had ever had a shot fired at him in the first place, and think all these intellectual thoughts and all of a sudden decide to go bomb the bejesus out of Hanoi. That's not the way to reach these decisions. There needs to be a very rigorous, relatively long-term analysis of the options. They need to ask, do we have the military capability to do it or not? I, I don't know why the Russians didn't attack us when we had a half a million guys in Vietnam, by the way. We were right in the middle of a Cold War that could have destroyed the whole world. And I've never seen that considered in this analysis of, of, the, of these wars. Um, the, 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 uh, and the other thing is that we need to exhaust every other possible option which is available. And I really mean exhaust before we even consider the use of armed forces. We won the Cold War, which is probably the biggest, ugliest, most expensive, most dangerous war since World War II, and there was never a shot fired in anger. And, and I think we can do the same thing in Syria right now, we can do the same thing in Iran right now. At least we have to exhaust every single possible option before we go for any others, because the costs otherwise are, are too terrible to imagine. I think one of the problems is a lack of consistent policy and leadership. If you look at what's going on, what happened in Libya, what's happening in Syria, we, we seem to flounder around and forget the lessons of history. And I think that's really one of the main factors as to why we have a problem. We need, we need more guys like Professor Miller around to uh, teach us <laughs> their lessons. I'm, I'm not paying these guys, really. <laughs> he, he did give us a very nice meal this evening. <laughs> <laughs> Guilty as charged. Um, yes, right here. Uh, my name is Ben Edlin. I'm in the class of 2014. Um, I'm in Professor Wright's seminar this term, and I had the opportunity to take Professor Miller's class last fall. And um, one of the topics that we go, go to a lot is this kind of process of othering um, with Mr. McGrath referred to as these kind of dehumanizing tactics of particularly when you're fighting an enemy that's a different race than you are and how much more kind of gruesome that makes the combat, particularly in Vietnam or the Pacific Theater of World War II. And I was just wondering how in Vietnam you all went about trying to win the hearts and minds of these mothers and children that you encountered while at the same time kind of your survival was based on this deep hatred for their husbands and fathers, and how when you got back to America, um, you had to kind of suppress that need um, and, and uh, let it normalize. So the question asks about the process of othering or dehumanization, which is associated with, with war and, and combat in particular. Uh, but you also asked about the contradiction uh, between the stated U.S. goal of, of winning hearts and minds, and you, you mentioned specifically trying to win the hearts and minds of, of women and children, while at the same time uh, directing this, this, this hatred as a result of the dehumanization process towards um, the, the, the men who were, uh, the, the soldiers were fighting against. Is that accurate summation? Well, let, let me start on the second part of that question. Um, when we went to Vietnam, we, I don't know that we used the term hearts and minds, I don't know what terms we used, but we had in mind that we needed to balance our 
uh, efforts to eliminate Viet Cong with the fact that we were walking through a lot of villages. You all have, you're all aware of that. Um, it's a, it was a, an extremely difficult task for which almost no, at least in the Marine Corps, almost no Marine was prepared. Uh, I went with the idea that I had a French background. I had years of French here at Dartmouth in, in high school. I went with the idea that somehow I could speak French to some of the uh, white, uh, white civilians because I knew they were of French descent uh, and learn enough, you know, to a sort of on a one platoon basis win over the hearts and minds of people. Um, it was nearly impossible. And the reason was that between 1954, the fall of Dien Bien Phu and when I was there, the infrastructure in the country had completely shut down. I would go into a village and I'd say, can I speak with the mayor? Well, the mayor was killed two years ago. Could I speak with any French-speaking citizens? And I might get a, a, a woman in her 40s, and yes, yeah, she would report she taught French as the second language in the Vietnamese schools. She, I couldn't tell whether her husband was Viet Cong. I couldn't, uh, all I know is that she didn't have a job. There were no men in the village. Um, she would, a lot of those folks would not talk honestly with us. The truth of the matter was that by that time, there had been such a development of an infrastructure within the Viet Cong, which you know, came indirectly down from Ho Chi Minh and was a strategy of sort of the first phase of the war, and we weren't even aware of it. We thought the whole war was a guerrilla war. That's where I was in 1965. The second phase, I faced the second phase when I went to up around the DMZ and the NVA who were poised to cross the river start coming across the river. It's the first time the United States realized that this was going to be a regular war. So winning the hearts and minds of, of, of people was impossible. And it, it goes to the very question of, of, of why we didn't know critically back as early as the 50s uh, about what the relative population's disposition was. If we had looked at it, I think we would have known in space this was an unwinnable war, and maybe we wouldn't have gone there in the first place. Remember my story about the pregnant lady. Uh, when I was there, 67, there was no, we were not about winning hearts and minds. We were about clearing out the real estate, getting the water away from the fish, which I think is one of the most inept comparisons I've ever read. It was, um, it didn't, it showed no sensitivity to exactly what the problem was. But uh, we'd long since lost the, uh, uh, the idea that we we're gonna win hearts and minds. We were gonna go out there and take the women and children out of the combat zone, burn down their villages, kill their animals and destroy their rice paddies. You ought to see the hole that a B-52 bomber makes when he drops one of these, what are they, five ton bombs? They're big big bombs, and they make a great big boom. And they make a hole as big as this, and maybe 10 feet deep. And they drop tens of thousands of those all over the rice paddy dikes in Vietnam. And then you're gonna run, win people's hearts and minds by destroying the very basic means by which they produce their food? It, it, the, it, it, was, it was impossible. As far as, Yes, you almost, I guess you almost have to demean the enemy because you don't, you don't know the guy on the other side. That's an amazing thing about combat. He's trying to kill you and you're trying to kill him and you don't know him and you don't really have any personal thing about him. And therefore you need to do something to the state of your head to enable you to do that it, and it's terrible. But there, there is a piece of that, but I, at least I can tell you in my case and I think Lee's case as well, we had huge respect for the NVA. Those guys were good. They were capable, well-trained soldiers, dedicated to what they were trying to accomplish, and they did a good job of it. And I think one of the problems we had is that the people higher, at least I had this impression, that the people higher up 
didn't understand that this was a professional military organization that we were up against. It wasn't a bunch of poorly trained, ill-equipped, little tiny people. They, it was a formidable enemy. So we had a lot of respect for them. The two objectives of winning the war and winning the hearts and minds of the people are irreconcilable. Yeah. <laughs> you can't do both. I ran all the aerial reconnaissance that was flown over the Mekong Delta by both the Army and the Air Force for about eight months. And you're not going to win the hearts and minds of the people when you're carpet bombing them, as uh, Glenn has said, with B-52s. You got free fire zones, or if anybody ventures in them, you're, you're, you got a free license to kill them. It, it's just a horrible situation. Yeah, I, that was a good question. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I, I don't really have anything to add to that. I would agree with what everyone has said. Question over here. Uh, my name is Mackenzie Robinson, I'm 14, I'm in Professor Wright's seminar. Um, I was wondering, we've been speaking of this unwinnable war, that, um, or impossible war, that um, some of you guys have uh, realized since being in Vietnam, and that you've uh, referenced in terms of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. And I'm wondering what you have done since realizing this, um, or if you've done anything in terms of reflecting on Vietnam going forward in terms of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Does that make sense? So the, the question is, how, how has their experience in Vietnam uh, informed their, their thinking about the Iraq and Afghanistan wars? Is that the question, and Mackenzie? And, your, and or your actions towards influencing future wars that America's choosing to engage in? Um, I guess the way I would answer that is that Having seen what I've seen, I have kind of shuddered. I know how good our men are and women uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, and we'll always come to the call. We've got the best military in the world. But I shudder because um, I think that, for instance, Afghanistan is, is not a terribly literate country, and our chances of succeeding there are, are pretty low. And we've watched several other countries not succeed there. So I, I'm not real confident about it. So I've taken no action, but I, um, that, it, it certainly has affected my thought pattern over the years. I live in London. I'm about to move to Amsterdam, but I live in London. And the biggest political demonstration that ever happened in London was the demonstration against the Iraq War. And I was right in the middle of it, shouting and screaming and saying, don't attack Iraq. Every week, almost every week, for the last 10 years, five years at least, I write letters to my senators and to the president saying, get the hell out, stop it. This is not the way we do it. And I, uh, I strongly advocate for the vets. It's the, the Walter Reed situation that happened, was it four or five years ago, in which they discovered that the care of the most seriously wounded vets was Mm -hmm. worse than terrible, should not have allowed to, been ha to have happened in the first place, and it was really a terrible thing, and I really screamed about that. So, but you know, you can't, you, you're one voice in the, a voice crying in the wilderness. <laughs> uh, you can do all you, you can, and you can say, I know about this because I've been there, and it, it's ineffectual, it doesn't, I come here and I tell you my experiences, but it's, you feel pretty powerless. Go ahead, Jim. My thoughts are that you can't impose a democracy on what's basically a tribal society that has never experienced it in its history. There's no history of democracy in Afghanistan. There's no history of something like the, the Judeo-Christian tradition where you treat individuals with respect and respect their civil rights. I think we're in an impossible situation despite the efforts that are being exerted by our very professional military representatives today. I agree. Uh, my uh, Vietnam experience certainly has informed, you know, my own political views, and um, and to to see uh, the same kind of situation repeated over and over again. Uh, we had a conversation at um, lunch today with uh, 
Captain Wartman of the ROTC, and he was talking about, um, you know, how in Iraq they were hamstrung time and time again with red tape of one kind or another. And that's because we get into these situations um, where there isn't a clear objective, um, where um, it's uh, we're, we're, we're inserting ourselves um, amidst um, an array of contradictions um, and conflicting objectives. Um, in the first Iraq war, there was no conflict of objectives. It was clear. But if you can find a clear objective with what we're doing in Afghanistan now or in, uh, or in Iraq, uh, please let me know. Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I'm a 14. And my question uh, for you all is, what was the most <coughs> surprising or shocking thing that you found um, when writing these essays that we read and that are going to be published soon? Um, and did it change, did writing about uh, your experiences in Vietnam change the way that you perceive your experiences in Vietnam at all? Uh, I'll try that one. Sure let, let me just re oh, re sorry. rephrase yeah, the question. So the, the question asks about the experiences that the panelists have had about writing the essays that are appearing in the volume, and specifically, did writing the essays cause them to, to change or perhaps reflect differently on their experiences in Vietnam? I, I would answer that in this way. I. Um, had so completely shut down from my return from Vietnam that the first time that I um, even considered opening up was when there was a, a Marine Week in Cleveland, Ohio. And I stood there and I looked at 25-year-old Marines and I said, how did I do that then? And I realized for the first time in my life, I was 25. <laughs> then. And I said to myself, um, I need to talk about this. I need to start writing about this. So the writing became my therapy to get me to open up. Um, everybody's different. Everybody handles it differently. But that was my experience. And it's been enormously helpful in kind of balancing out. Um, maybe I should have done this 25, 35 years ago. But the fact is, writing about it has been terrific. Lee, can I ask, when did you have that experience? What, what year was that? June 2012. <laughs> I, I already told you that Phil was on my case about writing this thing. And the main reason I resisted was I was frightened of doing it. I, I think, except for my wife, my third wife, that says something about stable personal problems. Uh, she's the only one I'd ever talked with about my experiences in Vietnam. Um, and it, so I was scared to death, quite honestly, to have to go through the experience of reliving some of these things. And it's probably the most difficult thing I've ever done, to go back and think about those things and uh, articulate them. And th there's a lot more than what's in the pieces you've seen. There's just not enough space for all of it. Uh, I'm glad I did it. I, I, I have more confidence that my, my observations are shared by my colleagues here. They're not just me and uh, kind of a strange guy, and that helps. Um, and going through the course so far, Professor Miller's course, has really helped a lot for me to put it into a historical yeah. perspective that, that I was a piece of a much bigger thing than just taking some stupid hill for the third time, <laughs> uh, it made a big difference to me. So it was, it was a, this is really the first time I've ever really shared this with anybody. I'm thinking, <laughs> which is a rare occasion for me. <laughs> this I is military intelligence now. <laughs> An oxymoron. I think that Initially, it was a defense mechanism that many of us used because of the vast popular 
the, the vast unpopularity of the Vietnam War, we didn't want to hear about the fact that we were baby killers or reviled as assassins or incompetents or some sort of freaks who were trying to implement a policy to conquer Vietnam. That morphed into putting a shell around your feelings to protect yourself from thinking about things that were unpleasant. I don't know when I, I first started to open up, but it was probably not until maybe 10 years ago. One of my problems that was alluded to earlier by Glenn is that I've been diagnosed as having Parkinson's disease associated with exposure to Agent Orange. And perversely, that enabled me to talk a little bit more about that disease and to deal with some of my problems and to talk to people about the war and explain to them why we did what we did and the fact that we, we really tried to do the best we could, but it wasn't adequate given the circumstances under which we were fighting. I, I um, you know, I had a few sort of stock stories that I occasionally told to uh, to people, not very frequently, but uh, when I sat down to write about it, I said, well, well, I just looked at this and said, well, why am I, why do I tell these stories? You know, what, what, what's, what's the common thread? Why did these stick out for me? And, um, and uh, having to write this essay, you know, forced me to, uh, to think about it. And I found it to be, um, you know, a more emotional experience than I had expected. Um, uh, if, if Phil had not asked me to do this essay, I probably would have happily gone through the rest of my life just, you know, stuffing it under and uh, not thinking about it. Um, but, um, and, and, and it was interesting that I thought I was handling it pretty well uh, for the most part. Uh, I got the essay written, I got it sent off, um, you know, and I, I gradually, you know, was feeling some emotion, but it really didn't hit me until I sat here last year um, and started talking about it because I just hadn't um, gone very deeply into it uh, in the past. And so um, I have found it a rather transformative experience, to tell you the truth. Let me just add and, and build on that last comment because I've been thinking about this as I've been sitting here. I, I said this in my opening remarks, but let me emphasize it lest we all, you all think that we are um, PS, PTSD cases ourselves. Um, I actually think that the experience I went through as, as um, horrific as some of it was, um, was the greatest experience that I ever had. Because it's like you've been on a ledge and you've almost fallen to your death off the ledge, but you've been on that ledge. And one of the things that taught me that I'd never known is how far you can reach within yourself to do something if you really want to do it. And that lesson, you know, transcends all of the horror that you went. And if you think about it long enough, what you do is, and maybe it's rationalization, maybe it's not, but you learn from it and you teach yourself that you can do things that you, you did not know were within yourself. And that's the positive side of that. And I, today, I, I'm not sure I would recommend my own children going into the military but I do think that the military, and I saw it in hundreds and hundreds of troops, made people successful. Some went the other way. Some had P PTSD and other problems. But a vast majority of them were successful. They went on and got schooling. Uh, the vets we met here, the vets I met in Cleveland are successful. And so as rough as that experience has been, Oh, there's a positive side to this. Hey. Um, my name is Ben, I'm also 15. Um, who, who you're asking the question? Oh, it's, it's just all um, So in first day class, we learned two kind of theoretical points of view on 
kind of in conclusion of the Vietnam War. One was the orthodox point of view, which is that the war was unwinnable from the outset. And then the other one was the revisionist point of view, which said that the war wasn't necessarily unwinnable, but it was poor decision making from senior level military and administrative officials, as well as domestic dissent from the media that kind of created an unwinnable war. And so my question is, do you think that the, and it seems like you guys prescribed to the uh, former, but do you think that there, this was an unwinnable war from the outset, or it might have been bad decision making from higher up military and administrative officials that led to becoming an unwinnable war, or if it was just not an unwinnable war at the point? So the question asks, in excellent historiographical fashion, <laughs> distinguishes between the, the, the orthodox school of, of Vietnam War interpretation, which suggests that the war was unwinnable from the outset, no matter what the United States could, could have done, would have done, uh, versus the revisionist point of view, which says that, no, the war could have been winnable if United States leaders had done something differently, or perhaps if, if some other group in American society had not somehow betrayed or undermined the, the, the war effort. Um, so the villains there can be U.S. leaders, military, political leaders, it can be the anti-war movement or the media or, or whatever. And the question is, uh, you're, you're wondering if the panelists subscribe to the orthodox view that the war was unwinnable at the outset, or if, on the other hand, there might have been a different set of decisions that might have led to victory. Well, if you ask it in that way, uh, the way you asked it, I think it was a false choice. And um, the way I would answer it is that if there had been the right uh, set of analysis back, maybe as early as the 50s, um, perhaps a different approach would have been taken. Uh, we basically um, didn't have the courage to, to not support the French. We didn't have the courage to not support DM, and yet I'm convinced, just reading the materials that you've given us, um, that um, our government knew that that wasn't the right strategy. They knew it at the time. Mm. Uh, I, I, that's my belief, and and I, I I thought I wondered about that when I went to Vietnam. I'm I'm convinced that that's the case today. I don't sort of doesn't completely answer your question, but it's my answer. Jeff. You can't change history, as Professor Miller will tell you. I think the war was basically unwinnable from the get-go. And I shudder to think of what price we would have to pay to well, win that, con that conflict. We uh, had a half a million men under arms, and we weren't doing a darn thing except getting people killed left and right. I would probably rephrase it slightly. Um, <laughs> I think it was both unwinnable and mismanaged <laughs> at the strategic level. <laughs> Another way of false choice. Uh, uh, as an infantryman, I was concerned about the next 50 meters in front of me. <laughs> and I did what I was told to do with my 150 <laughs> troops. And I really, I didn't, I'm no wiser than, you know more than I know. With this class and your study of history, you know more than I know about that. I, I don't pretend to be an expert. I have an opinion. Uh, my opinion, first of all, remember the rules I was talking about, about engaging in war. We didn't exhaust all of their options, even as early as what Lee is talking about. There were other things we could have done besides sending military force into Vietnam to accomplish our national objectives for our national good. And we didn't even try those. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it was no matter what we, how good our management of our war was, it was unwinnable. But it was not well managed in many, many respects. I said things about that already. Question, Chief. Um, I'm here in the 70s, and my question for all of you is, what is your So the question is, is there a single event or memory from their time in Vietnam which really brought home for them this notion that the war was unwinnable and the United States was not going to succeed no matter what it did? Is that correct? I, I, I guess I'd answer that by, uh, at the end of my tour, I was asked to be part of interrogation teams for villagers in the villages, and I realized that to a person, um, their minds had been won. They were already 100% fighting um, us. 
and there was nothing we could do. And it was that, I guess, the last last month. I said it's it's impossible. My experience, I related, is uh, major firefight uh, all night long. Lots of casualties, uh, both sides. Chaotic beyond belief. Uh, in the morning, it was it was a battlefield to calm down the the NVA who were still alive were gone, uh, and we went back to the fire support base. And I was just sitting there, and I said, "This is not the way to do it." I'm not sure that I fully understand the question. Well, you, you did indicate that you thought the war was unwinnable, and I guess the question was, was there a particular moment during your time in Vietnam where you, you, you came to that realization? Probably within the first month after I got there. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that makes me a slow learner. I <laughs> <laughs> me, me too. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I think by the time I left Vietnam, um, I saw no evidence of any progress whatsoever in the year that I spent there, and um, and I, you know, I and even after I left, I heard nothing that indicated that um, you know there, there there was any chance of that war um, being winnable in any you know military sense in any case. Okay. Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan Marinelli, class of 2016, Army ROTC. Uh, can you please just describe the quality of the, of the uh, intelligence reports you were receiving on the ground in your infantry platoons? So the question concerns the quality of intelligence that these men, all of whom served as officers, were receiving during their service in Vietnam. I don't believe we received any. <laughs> <laughs> What was the, I'm not sure. what the, the quality, quality of the quality of the The Viet Cong were so elusive, and they operated in such small numbers of groups. That getting intelligence, the only way you could get it is to to interview somebody you captured, and they're going to lie to you. Um, the, the, we we responded supposedly to intelligence reports that there's an enemy unit here or there's an enemy unit there. And we jump in the choppers and go over there and sometimes they were there and sometimes <laughs> they weren't. Uh, I, I don't think that the idea of, and then we had these people sniffers. So these, this thing, would they'd fly around in this helicopter with this device that sniffed, I think it sniffed uric acid, which is in urine. And so if you, if you found some urine on the ground, it was supposed to mean that there were people there. And so then they would say, oh, there's a whole bunch of people here, and then you would go, and it turned out it was a bunch of monkeys or something like that. <laughs> um, so that wasn't a very effective so way. Meant there was no intelligence. Uh, there was some aerial reconnaissance, but at least where I was, that didn't work so well. So I don't think there was any real... We knew about the big major NVA movements down the Ho Chi Minh Trail pretty well. Uh, that was, that was, and we had some reports from the Special Forces A-teams and the Long Range Reconnaissance Patrols. But those are major movements for the most part. I can give you two examples of problems we had with intelligence. I had two friends who ran the Order of Battle section for the Fourth Corps. Mm -hmm. The Order of Battle section delineated what units you were dealing with, enemy units, their equipment, the table of organization, officers, and so forth. <coughs> One of the things they had to do each month was prepare a road report, indicating which roads were safe to drive on without armed escort, which were green, Amber, you could proceed with caution. Red, you had to go with a full-armed military convoy. So these guys weren't stupid. They made it at the maps and reflected the fact that you couldn't drive outside the base camp without running into a red zone where you needed an armed escort. <laughs> so they got called into the colonel who was commanding our section, and he said, this can't be. Well, why is that, colonel? Well, it's worse than last month. And it can't be worse than last month. It's got to be better than last month. So take it back and change it. <laughs> So they did. They didn't have any choice in the matter. That's One right. of the things I had to do was every morning at 0700, I checked with the Vietnamese adjutant to get the casualty figures for the previous day, which were three figures, killed, captured, and then suspects detained. 
Then the U.S. Army, in its infinite wisdom, came down with a directive that the war was going to be fought on a midnight-to-midnight basis, and we had to report about 12 different casualty figures, estimated killed by air, or killed by ground fire, etc. So I turned this over to the Vietnamese adjutant, and he smiled, and I said I'd be back the following morning, and I went back the following morning, he gave me the same three figures he'd always given me. And I did that for two or three days. I'd phone the, the, the figures up to Saigon when the colonel in charge of our detachment called me and he's screaming at me at the top of his lungs, asking me why I'm doing this to him and making him look bad when I should be filling out the report the way it filled out. And I said, but colonel, the Vietnamese will only give me the three figures. He said, that sounds like a personal problem, Captain. I got a personal problem. I had a personal solution. <laughs> I went back and I took the total figures and I made up a chart and I filled in the fudge factors and for the rest of the war, 25% of the casualty figures that Lyndon Johnson was reporting to the American public were products of my overactive imagination. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. great. It's true. <laughs> but Nobody bothered me again for the rest of the time I was there. <laughs> It's it's well, it's funny, but it's true. Well, so you guys uh, agree with one, me? There's no intelligence. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> my my one direct contact with military intelligence um, must have come right after this change in policy about the road conditions. <laughs> I remember uh, that story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where I was, um, I don't know if I had it in my essay or not, but I I, I had to get from uh, our base. Um, main base camp, Bearcat, to Swanlock. Um, and, um, and one leg between Benoit and Swanlock, um, we checked beforehand and they said the road was green. And when we were halfway to Swanlock, we realized we were the only ones on the road. And it was normally a well-traveled road, not just for military, but for the Vietnamese as well, just you know, bringing products back and forth. So. And we had to make a decision, you know, do we turn around and go back and, uh, or, or continue forward? We knew something was desperately wrong. So we continued forward, and um, the military intelligence at the other end said, oh, that road was code red, uh, which mean, meant you were only supposed to travel it with an armed convoy. It was just me and my Jeep and driver and a machine gunner. So thank you for the change in policy. <laughs> <laughs> Ross. My name is Ross. I'm a 14 in Professor Miller's history class. And my question is, well, so sort of building off the responses that you each gave about the moment you realized the war was unmittable, I'm wondering how you reconciled the personal conclusions that you came to about the, whether or not it was possible to win the war with the idea of chain of command and being told that you had to do something you didn't necessarily do then, personally. So the question is, once the panelists came to the recognition that the war was unwinnable, um, how did they reconcile that with having to continue to participate in this war effort that they now believed was unwinnable? My realization came at the end. I was out of the field, and I just let it go. I didn't um, do anything after that, and as I said, I kind of remained quiet for the next X years. It's an irreconcilable problem, and that's why most of us probably didn't want to talk about it three years after we got back. Said. I, I have struggled with this problem a lot. It's uh, because I resigned. I still had, I think, five months to go in Vietnam. As a regular Army officer, I had to serve for at least two years after I submitted my resignation. Um, and I had a high school classmate, he went to Stanford. Uh, he burned his draft card in protest of the war and ended up spending, I think, about 10 years in prison as a result. He took a moral stand. And uh, uh, I suppose, in some ways, I think I should have taken a moral stand. Maybe I should have run off to Canada or I don't know. Uh, on the other hand, there was, a, there was a contractual obligation. I said, I am going to do this. There was a personal obligation that I, I was going to do this. 
there was a sense of obligation to the troops, whether or not the war was winnable, there was still the, the mm. fact that we had troops there that needed to be taken care of and led, and uh, somebody needed to do that, and I knew I knew how to do that, so there was, there was that piece of it. Um, uh, I suppose, luckily, I was, um, I was uh, wounded before my full tour in Vietnam was over, and so I, then I went back to Fort Devens, and I did basically what Lee did. I just dropped out. But I still haven't resolved that really in my head as to what, what I should have done. Maybe I just took the easy way out. I don't know. I mean, once you're in the theater there, I mean, it's, it's not as if you can say, well, it doesn't look like this relationship's going anywhere. I think <laughs> I'll bug, bug out. <laughs> 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 I mean, there's the problem of transportation home, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is that. Yeah. Mm. Uh, my name is Madeline. I'm 16. What's the hardest thing that you had to do with when you were there? Either decision you were forced to make or the thing you had to confront or something that was really found that you thinking or that sounds about <coughs> So the question is, what is the, the hardest thing they encountered in their service? Something they had to do or something they saw or experienced? The hardest thing we had to do? Yes. The hardest thing I had to do was, after I got down to the Mekong Delta, I was assigned to the aerial reconnaissance section. I was a first lieutenant and my commanding officer was a captain. There were three officers in the section. All of us occupied flight slots and rotated around the low altitude, low and slow, aerial photo and spot video missions. I had flown on a mission the same day as my commanding officer. I was the last person to see him alive. And I was at the airfield when his body was brought, brought it back in after his plane had been either shot down or crashed and disintegrated. The medevac helicopter came in and hovered over the, the runway surface and the crew people were trying to get the stretcher out when one of the men fell and my commanding officer's body rolled down on the runway and I had to identify it and get him into a body bag for shipment home. And one of the main ways that I was able to ascertain it was him was because it was, he had his wedding ring on. So that was my toughest day and I realized I was in for a long tour and I also realized that I had to step up and take over his position. That's it. I never forgot that. Yeah, I have, I guess, two. The, f the first uh, was that it, 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 when you're in a firefight, it's, it's amazing the amount of violence that you're capable of wreaking on a fellow human being. It scared the death out of me. It was almost as scary as being in a firefight. You can be, there, there, were, there were capabilities in me that I didn't know I had. And none of them were very pleasant. Some of them were absolutely terrible. Uh, and that was, um, that was a terrible realization that I was capable of that. It was, it was dehumanizing beyond imagination. So that was one. Uh, the other, which was much more emotional for me, was I had one sergeant who was wonderful, a great leader, Sergeant Wright. And we came up to a little patch of woods one day and he was shot and killed. And he wasn't dead. When I, I loaded him myself onto the chopper and the, the, uh, his blood was on my hands when I put him on the chopper. I, I think the hardest thing that I had to do was to talk to when we lost men, um, talk to the families. One of the responsibilities of, uh, well, really the company commander, but in the last part of Vietnam, I was the company commander by default, and our company commander had been killed. And I was a senior lieutenant, so we didn't have enough men to have a company anyway, so I might as well run it. Um, and it was very difficult, because you get very close to these men, uh, they're like your brothers, your sons, uh, and all of that. And the thought, it, 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 the first time I did it when I had to talk to a mother, uh, they would always, if we got back to a base, a lot of this we did by letter. 
Um, and we tried, at least the Marine Corps, we tried to write personal letters. But I never felt that was a mu enough. So if I ever had a chance to call, um, you know, from a, a, a phone somewhere, that's what I did, even if it was after I returned. And I did that several times. It was very, very hard. Uh, I never visited any of those mothers, but I did talk to them on the phone. I was lucky in, in some ways. Um, uh, I was in the artillery. Um, we tend to operate behind the lines. One, one of the uh, um, better known artillery slogans is, we lend dignity to what would otherwise be a vulgar brawl. Um, but um, it was um, one, one of the most difficult things I had to deal with um, was um, my first night in Vietnam in the unit. Um, the, um, the battery commander uh, was going home and um, he was, he was celebrating uh, in the hooch and, um, and I had to listen all night long going full blast to Simon and Garfunkel uh, singing, singing Homeward Bound. <laughs> and um, we were very fortunate, I think, in our unit. I mean, the whole time I was over there, we didn't lose anybody. Um, and um, it was, um, you know, we, ha we had a very uh, well-run uh, organization. Um, I mean, despite my overall assessment of, um, of what the war was doing, um, our battalion was doing what it was trained to do and doing it fairly well. Um, it was just the sort of overall contradictions of the war that, um, that um, you know, sort of made that, made the possibility of success extremely <coughs> limited. We have time for uh, one more question here. Let's hear from Morgan. I'm Morgan Sutherland, class of 2014, member of Mr. Miller's class. If you had the opportunity today to sit down with North Vietnamese soldiers <coughs> and veterans, do you think that would be a, a fruitful experience? Do you think that you would be able to relate to them? Or do you think that there's so much pain and you know, bad memories about your experiences there that you don't think that you'd be able to get through with that or, or at least get something positive out of it? And I, that's a question for everyone. Okay. So the, the question is, if the panelists had the opportunity today to meet with some of their former enemies from the battlefield, uh, North Vietnamese or Viet Cong soldiers, would they, would they welcome that opportunity? Would that be a productive opportunity uh, for them to um, exchange ideas and, and, and think about the war? Or, or do they not think that would be something worth, worth pursuing? Is that accurate? OK. I would do it. I would do it. I don't know that I'd I truly welcome the opportunity to be a lot of trepidation in it, but I think it's something I'd want to do, and uh, I assume that the other person would want to do it too, and maybe we'd learn something. Isn't there a book? Yes, I was just looking it up. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the name. There is a book where that, how, that already happened, um, yeah. and it, it's, uh, it's quite moving. Uh, I would uh, I would enjoy the opportunity. I would look forward to it. It's, it's I'm not sure that any anything positive except yeah. to make us feel a little bit better would would result from it. But <laughs> uh, I have huge respect, especially for the NBA soldiers. Yeah. They were they were good, and I I would enjoy the opportunity to sit down and talk with them. Not for me. <laughs> Understood. I I honestly think that um, we would have a lot in common yep. to share. And there is a good, good book. It's, uh, I, um, I, I'd forgotten the title. It's Goodbye Vietnam yep. by William Broyles. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting book. And he went back and he did talk to some of the people that he had opposed uh, 
personally. I mean, in, in, in the areas where he was stationed, um, he talked to commanders and soldiers in unit that he actually fought against. Um, and um, and they did have respect for each other, and it was um, it was a very positive, yeah. a very positive experience. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd add this. Um, a year ago, I met a gentleman who was 93 years old. He had been conscripted in the German army to fight against the Russians. Um, he was one of 37 people out of his regiment that came back alive after World War II. He ultimately worked for the State Department, and he was sent uh, in, in the middle of his career in the State Department back to Russia and actually met people who were on the opposite side of, of the line from him in Russia. And this is when the German troops were fighting Russians, and most of them froze to death back in World War II. It was an astounding story, but that story gave, would give me confidence to go out and and talk to the other side. Yep. Great. All right, we've reached the end of a lot of time, so we're going to have to. <laughs>